welcome to lab. We'll get started in uh, just a second here. Again, we're going to talk about the uh, titration experiment, which was just posted, and some of the parts of that. And then afterwards, obviously, you could go and work on it if you like, or if you have questions on that or the software lab, I'd be happy to answer them and stuff like that. Again, we'll get started in just a minute or two. Okay, so why don't we get started talking about, so again, uh, since we talked about, I think last week or a week or so ago, uh, sort of the buffer experiment, uh, today we're gonna talk about the titration experiment, which has just been put up. So the titration experiment, uh, much like the other ones, uh, is in a module by itself. So I think I moved it to the top so it'd be easier to find. And there's three parts as of now. There's part one, there's part two, and there's part three. And even before part one, there's sort of an uh, introduction uh, to titrations. And I think there's a video, and I think there's even a quiz that you gotta take, I think, about titrations as well. So kind of right before part one in the module, uh, after sort of some introductory type of uh, information, uh, you'll find like a little, I think, type quiz that you gotta take, so I'll leave that up there for you as well. Um, so part one of the experiment uh, is really, uh, for now we will do the entire experiment. Um, <clears throat> so these are three sort of uh, different parts of the experiment. We're gonna talk about each of the parts and give you an idea as to uh, maybe what you should be doing, what you should be looking for in terms of uh, sort of calculations and stuff like that that you might come across. So let us talk about them first. Uh, we'll do part A of part one. So part one of, of this experiment, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is where you're going to standardize uh, your, hydro your sodium hydroxide. So in all these titrations, in the burette will be your sodium hydroxide and in the beaker or flask or whatever they use in the simulation i think it might be a beaker uh you have your acid yeah so in part one it's khp which is potassium hydrogen phenylate uh, which is a monoprotic acid uh in part part two you will have your AL, and then you also have your so In all these dissertations you'll be doing this experiment, you'll be adding the sodium hydroxide from the burette to the beaker, uh, which will always contain your acid. Obviously, you pick an indicator, right, to use something like phenolphthalein, I think, is in some of the simulations. 
and uh, you will actually do the titration. So in part one of the, uh, of the experiment, you're going to standardize your sodium hydroxide. So you basically will know the molarity of your sodium hydroxide. And this is very similar to probably the titrations you did in Chem 50. And you're basically going to, again, have your sodium hydroxide. You will have your KHP. You'll add some indicator. You will use the simulator, and you will actually do the titration, obviously, to the light color of pink. And you're going to do this titration, so you would have the chemical formula, which is not KHP, by the way, so you should look up the right formula. So I think it has you, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but I think it has you sort of a quick titration and do a couple of kind of good titrations, and uh, you should be able to get sort of a average part one of the experiment. So again, for some reason, I don't think it's going to be grams of the KHP. I think for some reason for the simulator, it's uh, going to be milliliters, but they will also give you the, um, they'll give you the molarity of it. So obviously if you have, uh, you know, the milliliters and the molarity, you could do the correct calculation. Uh, very similar sort of it's probably standardization that you did uh, in Chem 50, where you held all that stuff in that little screw cap bottle in your locker and you had to do the titrations to basically figure out your actual molarity of your sodium hydroxide. So I believe part one is, is pretty much that. It's going to be a kind of a similar sort of titration. Uh, you're going to stop at the equivalence point. Uh, you're going to do some calculations to actually standardize your sodium hydroxide through the simulator. You'll get an actual molarity of your sodium hydroxide. And uh, again, you would technically use that molecular the rest of the parts of the experiment. Question sort of on part one of the experiment. Now, part two of the experiment. Is where you want to kind of take your titration in this case. So in this particular case, we're not going to titrate like a normal, like part one, or maybe how you have done before, where you titrate to the equivalence point, it turns pink, and you stop. You're actually going to continue through the entire titration curve. And obviously, one of the main goals of part two of this experiment is to generate a very nice-looking titration curve. You are again going to do this with the simulator. So you're going to again pick up your burette, you're going to pick up your acid, your base, your, you know, you may use your indicator, your pH meter, and you're going to be able to follow again, and you're going to have to record as you do this. Obviously, the pH to use you around the pH of 12 where you'll actually see it sort of level off. And you're gonna do this basically procedure here and the simulation for two types of titrations. You're going to do one titration in part two, which is a titration of hydrochloric acid plus sodium hydroxide. So this is a strong acid plus a strong base titration. And the second titration you're going to do is acetic acid, I believe, and sodium hydroxide. So this is a weak acid and strong base titration. So just like we talked about in lecture in terms of, you know, there's different ways to calculate the pH along the way for each of these. Um, we're having these two different titration curves. So when you're done with part two, you should have kind of two nicely looking titration curves. One that's your strong acid and strong base titration curve, and also your weak acid, strong base titration curve. Just like we talked about on the previous slide here, again, same situation, sodium hydroxide in the burette, acid in the bottom here. <clears throat> 
Now we did talk about this in class, right? So a couple of things, you know, you should kind of know off the bat here, hopefully, is if you look at the titration curve for our strong acid plus our strong base, When you look at that titration curve again, it should look like what we saw in class. And again, better than what I'm probably drawing here. Should look something like this. And the one thing that we should know, right, is the equivalence point here should be around a pH of seven, right? And that is because when we reach the equivalence point in this titration, The only thing that we have left is our salt, which is sodium chloride in this case. And that sodium chloride, right, is a neutral salt, which means, again, if you're sort of looking for your equivalence point, you should expect to see it, you know, around a pH of seven in this particular case. And that is different than, again, the titration curve that we would expect to see. You would expect it to be basic at the equivalence point. So again, uh, although the, the titration curve should look similar, although I didn't draw them very well, they're similar, uh, we will have sort of a different location in terms of where we would expect the equivalence point for each of these titrations. Again, our weak acid down here, basic. While up on top there are strong acid and strong base, we would expect again to be somewhere around that pH of seven. Any questions on that? So in part two, you actually have two separate sort of titrations that you're going to do. Again, you're going to run both of these titrations through the simulator. And like a normal titration, you know, you want to add slowly. You don't want the pH to sort of change too much. And you do need to keep track of all that because you will be asked in data analysis, obviously to generate these graphs, and you're going to need these graphs to answer some of the questions. Uh, some of the questions they're gonna ask you to do after you make these graphs in the sort of data analysis part is, they're gonna ask you to identify different points along these sites and ask you, you know, at which point is there just salt left, which would be obviously at the equivalence point. At which point is there excess, maybe sodium hydroxide, you know. So they're gonna ask you some of these questions and you're gonna to need to take your curve that you make and you're going to have to sort of label them. So you want to make sure that you do label those different parts on those curves. For some reason, people always sort of miss doing that part of it. So again, make sure that you do go through the data analysis part and you do uh, answer those questions and label the graph. Not only just the graph, obviously, with the proper labels and, and stuff like that, but that you on your graphs also include where you find uh, a lot of the questions that they ask you to sort of label. So make sure you don't miss any of those as well. In addition, we could use these titer tit tit I'm gonna spit that out, right? Let me try that again. Titration curves uh, to help us answer some other questions, especially for, for example, the uh, weak acid, the acetic acid, and the sodium hydroxide titration. So if we uh, still sort of part two. For example, if we focus in. <clears throat> On the titration curve for say our weak acid and our strong base and again this is going to be our weak acid and our strong base there's a couple of important parts the first part obviously is the equivalence point and let's just review what we got going on, say, at the equivalence point in this type of titration. So if we made our ice table, and we'll use the one that's there. And if we are at the equivalence point, this titration. Again, I'm just going to uh, 
like we kind of did in class. I'm just going to make up some numbers. So here I'm going to say that we started with four moles of acetic acid. And since we're adding the sodium hydroxide to the acetic acid, if we're at the equivalence point, that means that we should also have four moles of sodium hydroxide there, right? which means that when we do our change, it would be four moles. Now, oftentimes when you do a titration like this, people talk about another important point on the titration curve, and that point on the titration curve is in titration curves. You know, what is pH at half the volume of the equivalence point? And that's an important spot because at half the volume of the equivalence point, this is and the reason for that is, let's take a look at our do molarity. And as we talked about in class, when you're at this point in this type of titration, you should also recognize that what you have left at this point is acetic acid and sodium acetate, and those two things are a buffer. Which means that we could use our Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, pH equals pKa, plus the log of the base over the acid. And if we actually put our numbers in to that Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, what we will see is when we're exactly at half the volume to the equivalent point, the pH will equal the pKa plus the log of 2 over 2. And that gives us the log of 1, which equals 0. And that is why when we are at half the volume to the equivalence point, at that exact point in this type of titration, we know that the pH will equal the pKa value. And that's important because that would allow us to figure out the pKa value for our weak acid. It would also allow us to get to the Ka value for our weak acid as well. Again, right, uh, pKa is minus the log of the Ka which means the Ka would be the in The second sort of aspect of part two of this experiment, in addition to obviously making these really nice titration curve, being able to identify you know, these different parts of the titration curve, is that you can use the titration curve and information that's there to actually figure out the pKa value of your weak acid, but also figure out your Ka value of your weak acid as well. Acetic acid pKa value is like 4.74, so you can see how close you get. Now, people always are sort of confused that what does that exactly mean? And it does exactly mean kind of what it sounds like. Let's just say, for example, if you come straight down, right? I'm going to do my best there. And let's just say that is 10 milliliters at the equivalence point. You essentially would take half a 10, and that would put you at, say, 5 milliliters. You then would, better than what I'm doing here, go over to the pH, and it's at that point, the pH at that point would equal your pKa value. So it is as simple as that. You take half the volume to do that. Now, I'm trying to remember, but I believe they may have you use a computer program to do a first derivative graph, and that sometimes can help you really narrow in on uh, – sort of the volume and the pH at a particular volume. So if you sort of do a, uh, a second sort of derivative graph, which I think is in the data analysis, they'll kind of have you. I believe so. And then they'll use calculations for you and allow you to plot with that curve. So if I'm not mistaken, I think they'll have you use a graphical analysis program, uh, which I think is in the center. I'm not sure, but I believe so. And it will allow you to sort of do this sort of uh, derivative plot uh, with your uh, titration curve. And again, usually you see that sort of peak, as your equivalent point is, and that again will allow you to really narrow in on the uh, sort of volume and uh, pH as well. Questions on that in part two. So again, if you look at different part one, actually the entire equation curve, and you look at the graph, it obviously you need to identify those points. You'll need to use the curve to figure out things like a value, pKa value. And since the part two, we ask it is a C acid, which is an 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 acid,
asking questions on part two of the mission experiment. All right, so that brings us to uh, part three. And we're going to get on the next now. And I believe in part three, you're going to do again, and you're going to be looking for the whole curve. And what you're going to be trying to find out is a couple of things about the uh, the unknown acid. Uh, I believe you'll be also trying to find the pKa value, or maybe the Ka value. I don't remember which one, or both. Took more than layers of fuel. You can see back on the amount of unknown solid to do it, so uh, you don't run out of sodium hydroxide in your battery. Like that. So if for some reason, I think if I'm on this base, sort of random generating some notes, um, you know, if it two grams happens to be too much mass in part three, and you see technically you're running out of sodium hydroxide in your battery, like in normal cases, uh, cut back yeah, over the grams of note. So uh, if you get to part three and you see that's the case, like you use way more than 50 milliliters of uh, say sodium hydroxide, then obviously restart it again and just use a, a lesser amount obviously of your unknown acid you're going to do the same thing here you're going to uh, basically do a titration uh, you're going to try to get the entire titration curve so again uh, you should have i think like a sort of uh, titration curve here and then you're going to do kind of a similar type of stuff. Uh, in the case of the pKa value, you're going to do a similar So you can identify both the pKa value and also the Ka value of your unknown acid. To sort of second back up that, uh, to make sure that you know what your unknown acid might be, just in case you come across a couple of unknowns that have similar Ka values or pKa values, you're also going to calculate the molar mass here. And to calculate the molar mass, it is grams per mole, right? The grams part is pretty simple. That is the mass that you used in your titration. The moles part would come from your titration information. So remember at this point, you would have the volume needed to get to the equivalence point. So we would want to be looking at the equivalence point in this case. You also have your molarity of your sodium hydroxide. That will give you the moles of your sodium hydroxide. And I believe you may have either a monoprotic, diprotic, or triprotic acid. So I think somewhere, somewhere it will tell you if it's monoprotic, diprotic, or triprotic. I just don't recall. I'm sorry off the top of my head. I almost want to say they're all maybe monoprotic, but I could be wrong. By the way, if you need to write a formula to figure things out, HA, right, is the generic formula for a monoprotic acid. H2A is a diprotic acid. And H3A is a triprotic acid. And that's important in terms of balancing. So we'll just do the triprotic one. If you have a triprotic acid plus sodium hydroxide, this is H plus, and this would actually be A with a three minus charge. That's why there's a three here, which means when it comes together, we get water. Between the sodium hydroxide and the acid. So, um, again, I apologize. I don't know off the top of my head, but um, I think they will hopefully tell you, or if not, I will look into that and definitely let you know. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody will be the part three before uh, Thursday or anything like that, but uh, I'll double check that. So, just in case they're not all monoprotic on that unknown, you do want to make sure for this part of it down here that you do get the right mole to mole ratio which really will either be a one-to-one, -one, a one-to-two, or a one-to-three relationship. And then that will allow you to calculate the molar mass. So at the end of part three, you'll have a titration curve. You will also have the Ka and pKa value for your unknown acid. And you should be able to figure out the molar mass of your unknown acid. And I believe in the data analysis, they'll have you go into the program 
and sort of check to see uh, if you were kind of right or close to the correct answer. So I believe you're able to sort of check that. So that really is part three in the nutshell. Any questions on this experiment here, part three? So in each of these parts, uh, you should be able to use the simulation software. Again, you probably have to click the link and go out of Canvas to do that. It won't load in Canvas, so a reminder uh, that you'll have to do that. And you should be able to just like kind of with the buffer one, uh, kind of grab the stuff and or the pH and hydrolysis one, grab the stuff and you know uh, add it and do the titration and record that stuff. So I believe up there right now, what you'll see is sort of the instructions uh, for each of the parts. Uh, you'll see notebook sort of pages that you could use as sort of a template and word to sort of do your notebook pages and keep track of everything that you need to. Uh, you'll also see the data analysis, which will sort of explain to you the calculations that you need to do. So you do want to make sure that you a do when you're done with all these parts that you've gone through all the data analysis, you've done all the data analysis stuff that they asked you to calculate. They asked you to graph. They asked you to identify on the graphs. And uh, you want to make sure that you get all that kind of stuff, along with obviously the pre lab and post lab questions that will be there as well. Any questions on sort of the titration experiment? At this point, unlike the uh, buffer experiment, there's not individual uh, sort of submissions that you need to do. So I think it is going to be some type of lab report. And I'm not 100% sure yet exactly what that will be. Uh, so I'll let you know by the end, by Thursday or so, uh, what sort of the uh, lab report that you'll need to turn in for this one. My anticipation is uh, in terms of due date, there's not really a due date up there yet for this one either. Um, I am thinking that... Probably somewhere around May 19th, I think, is when this is most likely going to be due, this report. So that does give you a little bit of time, gives you a couple of weeks to sort of work through it, ask questions and stuff like that. Um, and so I'm thinking officially probably about May 19th, this uh, report will be due. Remember that the buffer experiment is due coming up at the end of this week. So... Make sure you are working through these labs. Don't wait till the last minute, especially with that buffer one. Again, you have some calculations that you need to kind of get approved before you can finish it. So this one, I think, again, will be maybe some type of uh, formal-ish lab report, probably our last one of the season here, um, unlike the buffer one where you're just going to kind of turn in all those papers uh, along the way when you're doing it. Any questions on this experiment or sort of the calculations? Again, I'll post uh, this part of lab up online when I'm done processing it. So if you need to kind of look back at it, you can. Yes, yeah, so hold off on that. I don't, want to, I don't think anybody's going to be starting today in terms of a lab report. I'm going to think about it in a day or two and kind of I'll let you know on Thursday uh, what type of lab report this will be. Um, I'm thinking it'll be more of a formal type lab report where you kind of type up some stuff and, and take some of your graphs and stuff like that. Unlike the buffer one where uh, the buffer one, which you're currently working on, is sort of uh, finish all those things and sort of submit each of those individual data analysis and calculations and stuff like that. So I'm thinking this might be a, a, our last sort of formal-ish report here for these experiments. So I think it's going to be something like that. I will let you know for sure on Thursday um, either during class or I'll definitely put an announcement up as well. But um, I'm thinking it will be something similar to that. Other questions or anything like that? So at this point, again, you should have plenty to be working on in terms of the lab component. I know, you know, it's not like a normal thing. Uh, don't wait till the last minute here to do these things because uh, it, it's still like a normal lab. There's a lot of stuff that you have to do and go through. Uh, so make sure that you keep on track with this. And if you have questions, make sure you ask. So coming up on this Thursday for lab as well will be like a kind of normal one since you got a couple of labs out there. 
Uh, we'll open up the lab one on Thursday as well, again, for questions that you may have on any of these uh, sort of experiments. And obviously on days that we're not together, if you do have questions, you can email me and I will try to obviously get back to you as soon as I can on that as well. Um, so for now, we're gonna do all the titration experiments. And um, again, uh, make sure you kind of keep pace with all this stuff so it doesn't really build up on you at the last minute and you've got all this stuff that you're not gonna be able to finish. So any questions on any of that stuff? Okay, so what I think I'm going to do is uh, at this moment, I'm going to stop this particular meeting right now. And I'm just going to do that because it's just easier for the video part of it uh, to upload. So I don't have to go back and edit out the rest of it. And I'm going to take like a 15 minute break and I'm going to restart the same lab meeting. So if you do have questions, you can come back in about 15 minutes and I'll be there for, you know, for the rest of our lab time for you to ask questions. But I'm going to officially kind of stop this one right now. That way I have less sort of uh, editing I need to do. And that way I can post this up there uh, for that. Yeah. Okay, so I'll see everybody in a minute and I'll answer your question right now.